Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. Good morning, dear English teachers. Can you hear me well? Good. A los compañeros que están ahí al fondo, por favor, rellenemos los espacios ahí adelante, por favor. And we're going to talk about a lot of topics. And today, yes, welcome to the colloquium English Teacher and Dialogues. First of all, we're going to please stand up and listen the national anthem. <laughs> of victory, victory of education, victories of good feelings, good emotion, and good purposes. We celebrate education and achievements, and we all move forward with the blessing of God, our Lord who pours upon over our wonderful Nicaragua, Vice President of Nicaragua, Rosario Murillo. As an important remark, it is an honor to mention that here in the Elena Arellano Auditorium, we have national authorities from the Ministry of Education. Please let me introduce them. Uh, Professor Christian Dalino Cerda, General Director of Primary Education. 
Professor, Professor Tessia, Principal Director of Secondary Regular. And also we have the teacher Jairo Hernandez Bermudez, Bachelor Degree Coordinator in English in a text. Also, we have the participation from the teacher Keren Azucena Romero Garcia, English teacher in primary education. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the general director of primary education, Christian Danilo Cerda. He is going to contextualize this meeting for this important event and the progress of the English learning strategy. Please clap your hand, please. Buenos días, maestros y maestras conectados a lo largo y ancho de nuestro país. Buenos días, compañeras, compañeros, asesores pedagógicos nacionales eh, de este Ministerio de Educación. En esta mañana eh, vamos a estar desarrollando un coloquio de docentes de inglés. Docentes en diálogos. Se llama, ¿verdad? Un espacio más que se abre desde eh, nuestra, nuestro buen gobierno de reconciliación y unidad nacional. Un espacio para crecimiento, un espacio para intercambio, un espacio para enriquecer la educación desde ese lugar donde se transforma y se evoluciona, que es el aula de clase. Por eso están conectados docentes, están conectados otros protagonistas como directores de centros educativos. Y es que precisamente, compañeros y compañeras, es bueno hacer un poco eh, de, de memoria histórica. En el año 2017, nuestro presidente comandante Daniel y nuestra vicepresidenta orientó innovar y recrear e incorporar a nuestros planes de estudio la asignatura de inglés en educación primaria. O sea, en el 2017, un equipo estructurado por los distintos subsistemas educativo, Ministerio de Educación, INATEC, CNU, iniciaron todo un proceso evolucionario para la educación de nuestro país. Por primera vez en la historia de nuestro país se lleva a las aulas de clase, a las escuelas públicas de educación primaria, el aprendizaje del inglés. Y este aprendizaje del inglés como una lengua extranjera como un idioma más que se suma a nuestro sistema educativo como parte de ese bien común, porque la historia nos dice quiénes aprendían inglés antes, qué generaciones lo hacían, solamente quienes podían, solamente eh, quienes tenían el alcance de poder ir a una academia, ir a, a, a un centro privado, pero no, aquí con nuestro buen gobierno no hay límites y vamos para todos, para todos y para todas. Entonces se instaló todo un contingente a nivel nacional de maestros y maestras itinerantes que se mueven de una escuela a otra escuela Llevando ese aprendizaje, facilitando aprendizaje del inglés para todas las niñas y los niños. Y así hicimos el inicio de una caminada enorme que fue únicamente posible con el liderazgo de los docentes, los maestros en aula, el liderazgo de los directores, de los maestros, de los delegados en el territorio, que en el año 2023, el año pasado, Completamos la primera generación de niños que egresaban de sexto grado de escuelas regulares y un porcentaje de escuelas multigrado. Entonces, eso es motivo de celebración, 
de victoria y de reconocimiento para nuestro país. Este año 2024 marca el inicio de una nueva historia de cómo se aprende inglés comunicativo bajo un marco de referencia internacional que es el marco común europeo de referencia para las lenguas en educación secundaria. Y todo el equipo de secundaria, maestros de secundaria, docentes en todo el territorio nacional han pasado por un proceso de formación, de capacitación intensiva y de uso, manejo de los materiales didácticos, de los libros de texto por acá presentes, tan eh, bonitos, contextualizados a nuestro país, tropicalizados a nuestro país, para que haya esa conexión y ese acercamiento entre el joven, el adolescente, eh, con lo que va a aprender. Entonces, forma tal de que podamos ir a una nueva forma de aprender inglés y que tengamos una generación de bachilleres en cinco años, se estará celebrando, ¿verdad? En cinco años, una generación de bachilleres que habla inglés, de verdad, que se comunica en inglés, que se expresa en inglés y que eh, reconoce que parte del desarrollo humano pleno de toda persona también es aprender otros idiomas. ¿Verdad? Hoy estamos con el aprendizaje del inglés, después vamos con el chino mandarín y así entre más aprendizaje y entre más eh, estrategias, oportunidades se pongan en manos de nuestra juventud y de nuestra familia, hay mayor crecimiento del talento humano en nuestro país. Y es que eso es lo que queremos. Y después transitamos hacia la universidad y transitamos hacia el INATEC. ¿Verdad? Que, por cierto, nos acompaña el compañero Jairo de Inatec, que prácticamente Inatec es el pionero en temas de inglés desde el punto de vista de marco como un europeo de referencia para las lenguas. Y Inatec, CNU, hemos sido como lo que hemos de ser, ¿verdad? Los hermanos juntos caminamos por un bien común, hacia un mismo objetivo en la gran estructura de fomentar, llevar, cultivar el amor por una segunda lengua, que en este caso es el inglés. Entonces, así, este, compañeras y compañeros, estamos a nivel territorial. Este año se entregaron textos para educación primaria y se entregaron los primeros textos y guías del maestro cuaderno de trabajo para los estudiantes en séptimo grado. Pero digo esto porque el reconocimiento es de todo y lo señalamos porque no podemos nosotros solo remontarnos a la historia de hace seis años, sino que es una responsabilidad de todos. O sea, acá desde el nivel central diseñamos, el territorio se implementa, las cosas pero necesitamos verificar que, que el inglés en primaria no se nos caiga, que el inglés en secundaria verdaderamente esté desarrollándose como se pensó. Y para eso vamos hacia la verificación de esta ruta de inglés en primaria y en secundaria. Vamos a recoger evidencias de que verdaderamente se está haciendo aprendizaje de inglés bajo las normas del marco común europeo de referencia de forma tal de que lo que nosotros comuniquemos sea real, ¿verdad? Para que sea real necesitamos verificar y necesitamos evidenciar el trabajo que nuestros maestros, nuestras maestras, nuestros directores en el territorio realizan. Hoy nos acompañan expertos internacionales y nacionales. Expertos nacionales de INATEC, compañero Jairo presente acá, nos acompañan expertos de la UNAM León, ¿verdad? Expertos, nos acompañan expertos de la editorial Macmillan, expertos top en lo que es inglés, bajo las normas del marco común, pero además se le suma hoy a este proceso de aprendizaje una experta del Reino Unido en didáctica, 
para todos los que somos maestros sabemos lo que significa la palabra didáctica y la profundidad de esa especialidad didáctica del idioma, del idioma que se está facilitando en la aula de clase. Entonces vamos a tener una riqueza de aprendizaje en este espacio y coloquio porque no es un foro, ¿verdad? No es un foro, no es un conversatorio así como que eh, hay un panelista y habla, no, es un coloquio, aquí vamos a participar, necesitamos interactividad, los que están acá, que saben de inglés, los que no sabemos de inglés y nos comunicamos en español, también preguntemos, porque es una responsabilidad de todo, y necesitamos un espacio, un coloquio abierto, con preguntas, con interacción de territorio, de los docentes, maestros que nos están acompañando a la distancia de forma interactiva. Esa es la diferencia de un coloquio, ¿verdad? A que un conferencista se venga a hablar aquí y exponer. Hay un intercambio, hay, hay premisas sobre las cuales se van a mover y hagamos realidad este espacio de aprendizaje para todos y todo. Y eso solamente se va a lograr con el protagonismo de ustedes, ¿verdad? Y todo el Ministerio de Educación debe estar conectado con esto. No es nada ajeno a la educación inicial, no es nada ajeno a la educación primaria, a la formación docente, todo en sintonía porque es una estrategia nacional de educación de nuestro buen gobierno y todos somos responsables de acompañar este proceso para que sea realidad y podamos obtener los frutos que esperamos en educación secundaria y primaria también. Buenos días, compañeras y compañeros. Thank you so much, Professor Christian Danilo Serna, General Director of Primary Education. Knowledge of language is the doorway to wisdom. Roger Bacon. Now it's time to present the methodology of this colloquium. Please. So we are all of you and here in this colloquium what is that is the name English teacher in dialogue. So this is the objective. As you can see, we want teacher in powers, right? We want teacher in intelligence. In this case, we want teacher who is uh, like teachers, director, principals, pedagogical advisor, and director from different schools. And the idea of this event is to exchange the ability, exchange different topics in order to, to empower the teachers in linguistic skills. So the methodology of this colloquium is divided in three steps. Step number one is the introduction. The moderator is going to introduce the, the, the expert, national and international experts, in order to start a conversation. Because we want to establish different topics. And the topic, the idea, it's about differentiation instruction. We want participation. We want that this colloquium dynamics and interactive. As we mentioned before, we have participation of different teachers in primary and secondary education, pedagogical advisor, and principal director of different schools. So we have different topics, as you can see. So one of the topics is an ancient communicative skills, English skills through differentiated instruction. That's gonna be the main topic during this colloquium. The conversation is about this context, is the main topic. Then we have the teacher role uh, in a differentiated instruction. After that, we're gonna have innovating strategy for differentiated instruction in English classroom. 
effective feedback for the English language learning process, and use of technological tools in differentiated classroom. So this is the topic that we're going to develop during this colloquium with the national experts and international experts and teachers too. So as we mentioned before, we're going to have the participation of different experts. So here do we have in virtual meeting and here we are accompanied by national and international experts, as I said, who are going to be the main presenters and facilitator in this wonderful event. Please, let's receive Jose Ovidio Torres Ingüenza, English Access Program Coordinator at the University Católica de El Salvador, UNICAES, with a master's and degree in teaching English. Anna Gringer, bachelor degree in teaching language and master degree in didactic or language learning in the west of England, University of Bristol. Marta Cecilia Laguna Torres from Unan Leon, master in degree in teacher foreign language and bachelor degree teaching English. Teacher Jairo Hernandez Bermudez, bachelor degree in teacher language and English language responsible up in ATED. And also we have the teacher Karen Azucena Romero Garcia, English teacher in primary education, and the teacher Sadie Rosales Quiroz, English teacher secondary education. So as you can see, this is the agenda during this colloquium. We're gonna have the participation of some cultural performance as the teacher Christian contextualized this event and the progress of the strategy in the minute. Now, thank you so much. Now we're going to listen a beautiful song. Would you like to listen? They are English teacher, right? They are children from of primary education. Clap your hand for them. They are going to sing a song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Excellent. We are sure they are doing great things. We're going to enjoy this special song for us. Clap your hands again for them. We're listening to you guys. They are from Bluefields Municipality.
Clap your hands. Excellent. Good job. They are learning English with all their English teacher. Now we're going to continue with them. They are the poem and leader turtle. Okay. They also are for Bluefield Municipality. Excellent, guys. You are smart. We really admire you. Yes. A little turtle. Excellent. We'll listen to you. Good morning. My name is Alexandra Salomon. I am going to be saying a poem. A little turtle. I am a little turtle. I climb so slow. I carry my clothes wherever I go. When I get tired, I put in my head, my legs, and my tail. And I go to Thank you. Nice presentations. Excellent. Good job. Learning another language, it's not just learning different words for the same things, but learning another way of thinking about things, Flora language. As you know, dear English teacher, we learn English step by step, and they are doing great things. And clap your hand for you because you deserve a lot. And now we have Leon, Nagarote Municipality, role play. We'll listen to you guys. Clap your hands for our students. Leon, excellent. Ready? Ready? Can you hear Can you hear me? Of course. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, my dear teachers. We are listening to you. Ready? We are to tell you to tell the truth from the story, the hard life, the intelligent and practical hard work life. The moral the truth will be is the for patient of in the end. We want to take a good, good part for having a good a future in teaching English as a good day. Let's do it. The three little pigs. One of the time in the three little pigs. One day, they built their own hog of a jet. The next day, a big bath gold came to the first hog. 
Little pig, little pig, let me coming. Cry the back. Yes, no. Not by the head of my sinny, sing, sing. I will not let you in. Then I hop and then I puff and blew your house down. Roll of the beast bad wall. He blew the house down. The first little pegs ran to the second house. The beast bad wall came to the second house. Little pig, let little pig, let me come. He's nerd. He's nerd. Not by the hair of my chinny, shin, shin, I will not let you in. Cry the second little pig. Then I huff, and then I puff, and blow your house down. Roll the big bad wall, he blew the house down. And the tear house. The big bad wall came to the tear house. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. He is not. Not by the head of my chin and chin, I will not let you. Create a dear little pig. Then I huff and then I puff and blew your house down. <laughs> we all let the big bad wolf. He off and puff and the car is down. So climb down the chimney and then in a big in a in a crash. He jumped he jumped out that way. He never he gave a thing that two little pigs live happily ever after in the hot main domain. It was a pleasure to have been with you by sharing this time our Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation, dear English students. They are from seventh grade. Also, we're happy because in seventh grade, we're going to take into account ludic activity, role play, interview. We're doing great things with our English teachers, too. And now we're going to talk about Mr. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Do not let your enthusiasm go out. A beer shop as a valuable is a necessary. Works aspires always tends toward the highs. Ruben Darío. Now, dear teachers, now I would like to present the moderator of this colloquium, teacher Efraín García. Please receive clap for him, please. And we're going to start with the colloquium, the conversation between the national experts and international experts. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to English Teachers in Dialogue Colloquium. So I want you to please Turn on your camera, I want to see how many of you are connected today. Okay, English teachers from all around the country, please turn on the camera. You're allowed to turn it on. So I want to see how many of you are connected today to this amazing event, English Teachers in Dialogue Colloquium.
I want you to turn on your camera, please. So I think you are allowed to do it. I'm part of the pedagogical advisors team at the Ministry of Education Central Offices, and I will be serving you as a moderator. So um, you will be hearing interesting presentation from national and international experts on very timely subjects which have a remarkable importance in our field. So as you can see, we have the participation from teachers in primary and secondary education from all around the country. Please turn on your camera, teachers, we want to see you. So there we have Minet Pozoltega, we have English teachers and students from the Caribbean coast in this, the South Caribbean coast of Nicaragua from Bluefields Municipality. Okay, thank you teachers for joining us today. Also, we have, we have the honor to count with the presence of different pedagogical advisor of Minet Central Offices here in Managua. So I, as I was telling you, you will be hearing interesting presentation from national and international experts on very timely subjects with, which have a remarkable importance in our field. Before starting, I want, you, I want to provide you with some specific instruction about the time management in this session. We will have an introductory workshop. It is going to be developed into 25 minutes. After, we will have some interventions from the audience. Then we will have 30, 30 minutes to discuss with different presenters on regard to some premises previously established. Okay, now moving along to our session, please welcome Professor Jose Ovidio Torres, English Success Program Coordinator at Universidad Católica from El Salvador. With a master's degree in English teaching, he will be talking to us on enhancing communicative English skills through differentiated instructions. Professor Torres, can you hear me? Mr. Mr. Torres, can you hear me? So I think the microphone is off. Okay, thank you, teacher. Very good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Okay, Professor Torres, I just want to take one minute to contextualize a little bit about how English learning is going on here in Nicaragua. Okay, so you see English subject has been part of our national curricula for secondary education for so many years. But since 2018, as a priority of our government, English learning was included as a subject for elementary students. Last year, 2023, we had the first generation of students graduating from elementary education with competencies on English language. Now, these students are moving on the seventh grade in secondary education. This is a historical event for our nation. But along these years, a lot of things has happened and we have faced a lot of challenges and one of these challenges is how to provide students with differentiated instruction in order to help them out to develop their communicative English skills. Take, 
taking into account that they are all different. They have different learning styles, but also taking into consideration that all of them have the right to be educated with quality. So we are pretty sure that you will share with us very interesting and helpful information on regard to this content. One more time, teacher, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And the audience is yours. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it is really an honor for me to be sharing here with you. Um, I also want to say congratulations for putting all of this together. Um, it seems that you're taking great steps into uh, becoming a bilingual uh, education or turning your education into bilingual. And that is something that uh, it takes time, but you're going the right way as far as I can see. Um, I want to thank the Ministry of Education in Nicaragua for the invitation. Um, you Please just let me know if the audio is working well, if, it's, uh, if suddenly uh, I'm experiencing troubles, I, I can uh, you know, manage it from here. So once again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am an English program coordinator. Uh, most of my work is in the field of second language acquisition. Uh, I also work as a teacher training as a teacher trainer here in El Salvador. And when I first heard about the invitation uh, to talk to you, uh, I felt very identified with the topic, which is differentiated instruction. Um, and I want to start by sharing with you a very short story. I started learning English when I was not really young. So I had to go to the university, start college, in order to start learning English. So it was really a challenge. Um, and one thing that I remember a lot is arriving in the classroom the very first day, seeing my teacher in the room saying, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session. And me feeling so frustrated because I was not able to understand what the teacher was saying. What makes it worse was that one of my classmates by that time just started talking to the teacher. He said, hey, uh, welcome to the class, teacher. I'm so happy to see you. So two things happened at that time. First thing was I felt frustrated because I didn't understand the teacher. But then I also felt frustrated because my classmate, the one sitting next to me, he had a pretty decent level of English. And that's the reality that most of us faced in El Salvador, and I believe in uh, South America and Central America. We are put in rooms uh, with students who come from different backgrounds, with different experience. And some of them have very decent level of English, but some others don't. So how do we work as teachers? What do we do so that we provide students with the possibility to uh, integrate themselves into a group of mixed abilities uh, students? Um, so this is pretty much what we will be doing today in 25 minutes, uh, the experience that I already shared with you. Uh, we will also see the X rate of teaching uh how does teaching really looks like and attention my purpose is not to teach you how to teach because at this point i'm surrounded by uh people who have been in the field for a long period of time so instead of learning how to teach we will just see it and you know get into a reminding process so that we uh clarify or remember aspects that we might have forgotten at this point. We will see just one way to promote communicative skills in the EFL classroom, which is a project-based learning, but that's not the only one. Let me tell you that. So I will be touching basis on that, but there are other methods that you can implement in your teaching. We will see the benefits, two examples of projects based learning activities that we have developed here and also tips and tricks and at the end i will close up with some final ideas on that 
So having said that, um, the program that I coordinate, English Access, um, it gathers students coming from public school uh, around Santana, and most of these kids come from uh, families with very little resources. Uh, families that have that do not have the money to pay for an academy uh, in order to learn a second language. So we have students with a decent level of English, and we also receive students with zero English. And we put students in the rooms, we place them, place them in the room, but most of the time what we see is the exact same experience that I went through in the beginning of my major. So students who feel frustrated because some people understand and some others don't. So this is a complaint that I heard from a teacher in my institution. Uh, he said, no matter how hard I explain grammar, or how hard I try explaining grammar, my students will just not use it. And it makes me feel frustrated. This is a comment from a teacher. When asking that teacher, he said, um, you know, maybe it's because uh, students are not ready for this. Uh, maybe it's because students don't like me. Maybe it is because students don't want to be in the room. So many things. But uh, the reality is this. In the classroom, we do have very limited time for instruction. Actually, our students meet three times a week for two hours. And honestly, that's very short. Uh, students have to go to regular classes in the morning, and then in the afternoon, they become part of English access. So it's very limited, two hours or six hours a week. Here is another reality. Um, even though we are in a private institution, resources are still limited. And not just resources in the classroom, but students. Some of them will rely on a cell phone as the only mean of technology, only means of technology, and that's all they have. So even though some of our teachers have wonderful ideas on how to develop communicative skills. Uh, it is hard when students do not have the resources. Um, it is another situation, and it is that students, as I said before, come from different backgrounds, so their proficiency level will vary. Some of them will be somehow proficient, some others will be zero. So putting them together, it's almost always a challenge. So that's the reality. That's the reality of the teachers. And that's why they uh, say that no matter how hard they try explaining grammar, students will not use it. Now, let's take a picture of teaching. Let's see the x-ray of teaching. So if we could uh, see or divide the whole process into three stages, this is actually how we look like. So first, teachers need to identify what students need in terms of the language. It means before I teach grammar, before I teach vocabulary, first, I need to know what exactly is it that my students will need that grammar that vocabulary for. Example, if I teach simple past tense, that's the grammar point of the lesson. If I teach it just as an isolated topic, as an isolated content, then students might feel bored at the end of the lesson. They might not feel that what they're learning is going to be useful for anything. So step number one, we identify why is it that we're teaching that specific content, that specific grammar pattern, that specific vocabulary. Step one. Step two, we go to the classroom and we teach, we explain, we use all the visual aids that we have at our, at our disposition. 
we explain grammar, we explain vocabulary, we teach pronunciation. And that's the only, uh, that's only the second stage in the process. But at the end, and most important than the previous ones, it will be the space for students to actually get to use the language. Um, my reality as a program coordinator, we always have this conversation with my teachers. They will spend, let's say, 60% of the time explaining grammar and, and only 40% of the time for students to use the language. And that's a terrible mistake. Um, they say, thing is that if I don't explain grammar explicitly, like from A to Z, they will not get it. Reality is, you break grammar, like the whole grammar, into several pieces, like smaller pieces, then you teach that little piece and push students to use that specific piece of the language, of grammar, of pronunciation. So, um, that last stage in the teaching process is maybe the most challenging, especially when we know the reality of our students, especially when we know that, yes, our students have different abilities, our students might be at a different proficiency level uh, by the beginning or in the beginning of the, of the lesson, in the beginning of the course. So how do we manage to include every student, to include every single kid in the use of the language, considering that they might have difficulties following the sequence of the uh, of the session? Well, there are several ways. Um, there are several methods. Today, I will be talking about just one, which is the project-based learning, which, let me tell you, it's nothing new. It has been over there for a very long period of time. I was reading and it says that it started in the 80s in Europe and in the 90s it became a little bit famous here in America. So it's been there for a long period of time, it's not new. Um, however, if the teachers know how to uh, make it happen, it will bring incredible results to uh, I mean, will provide students with the possibility to use those little pieces of grammar into communicative tasks and for real and authentic purposes. Um, how might this help my students? Or as a teacher, what exactly do I, yeah, what exactly do I need to do in order to get started? First of all, let's see the definition. So project-based learning, it's a teaching method. So stop over there. When we say it is a teaching method, it means that that's just the theory. That's just the idea. We teachers should organize our lesson. It's not the means. It's not the resources. So a project-based lesson might take several forms, might take several ways, uh, depending on the strategy that the teacher uses. And that I want to uh, point out from the definition is that it is a real word and personally meaningful project, real word. So all our activities in the EFL classroom should be useful and should be connected to something that students will do also outside the classroom. Example, preparing students for a job interview, it's something meaningful, it's something that it's very likely to happen. We teach grammar, we teach vocabulary, we teach content, and we connect it to something uh, that is very likely to happen in the life of students. And the last part of the definition that I want to, uh, you know, touch base on is it's meaningful. And it means it has to be connected to students. Students need to feel identified with that specific activity that we're developing. 
Okay, so far, um, we start need to start thinking about which tasks, which activities do I develop in my class so that it provides students with instruction that is going to be useful for a real world event for something that is going to happen to them in the future. And number two, let's make it meaningful. It means that students feel identified with that specific task. Add that to what we discussed some minutes ago about not teaching grammar in an isolated way, and then you will have the perfect formula for students uh, learning a second language for real communicative purposes. Um, how do I set up my project? How does um, TBL look like? Well, here I have prepared a very simple um, just to picture how my project should start. And the first element in my project is setting up a learning objective in which I will point out exactly how the uh, how the language will be mastered at the end of the lesson. So, end of the project. So everything starts with a well-written learning objective. Second step is you provide students with a prompt of the project. Um, you do not tell your students what exactly to do, but you present them with a situation, with a challenge. Example of a challenge will be, listen, in my community and uh, they have the menu in Spanish. We want to receive uh, people or we want visitors or clients uh, who do not speak Spanish. So how do we solve the problem? That's the second step in the PBL methodology. You provide students with a challenge. A lot of people will say, uh, what's the difference between project-based and problem-based? Well, there is just a very, very small difference, and it is about the length of the task. We will not get so deep into that because of, uh, of time constraints. So yeah, second step is uh, providing students with the three is you give students voice and choice. It means that students decide how they want to address the situation. Some of them might say, you know, we'll translate the menu and I will have a Spanish version and also an English version. And I will print it on paper. Some other students might say, you know what? We will a huge banner with the products and prices and everything in English so that some people will receive the regular menu but if they don't understand that one there will be a banner over there uh, with the information in English so that's the second way to solve the situation some other students might say you know what we're very good with technology so we will create an app on our phones and we will share the app to the customers, the clients, so they will have the menu in English online. There are ways to address the problem situation. You give students choice or voice and choice. It means they do make the decision about what exactly they will present. Next step is monitoring. And listen, this is key for uh, a good result at the end of the task, the teacher should be involved in a way that students will receive support if they need it. But teachers also need to be very careful not to disturb the problem. So the teacher will see, the teacher will identify if something is going wrong or if students need some support and the teacher will provide it. Only if it is once again, it's one of the most tricky parts in the uh, learning, in the project-based learning uh, system. Why? Because if 
students are not going the right direction, then the teacher can easily put students on task again or bring them on task. And that happens during the monitoring stage. The last stage is publishing the result. Now, going back to the example of the uh, menu, so students receive the challenge, they decided what to do, the teacher provided some support, and now that it is ready, let's show it up, let's present it. So on a particular day, students will project and everybody's going to listen, everybody's going to see it. All right. How do we make sure that the project is going to be meaningful or the project is going to connect to students? It is actually in step number three, which is the moment when students decide what exactly to do. It is their product. It is their project. And here are some benefits. So why am I going to go for uh, project-based learning and not the traditional Number one is that when you provide students with space for them to practice before they get to the moment of presenting, then students develop communicative skills and also they develop problem solving, solving skills. Problem solving skills will be useful not only in a classroom, but also for life. Students will have to experience different situations. For a job interview, they will have to order food from a restaurant. If they have the chance to travel abroad or to study abroad, they will need to be in a lesson or in a course that is taught in English. So uh, problems solving skills will be useful for real life. students with multiple chances to make mistakes. My experience as a language learner and also as a language teacher is that it is super important to know that making mistakes is part of the learning process and that nobody is going to try things so that they uh, repeat uh, sentences and uh, it, special uh, presentation that they will have at the end of the project. Um, it promotes collaboration, it promotes creativity, it should be fun, and it should be meaningful. So it means that students must feel identified with that. Okay, how uh, can we see a real project? This is something that um, we developed with my students here at Unicaes. This project will be college students. Obviously, their proficiency level is really good, I would say. And uh, they have access to technology. So the problem was, how do we sell El Salvador for visitors? so that we receive more visitors. I mean, so that we receive more people here in Brazil. So that was the challenge. And uh, different people came out with different ideas. Uh, the one, the information that was going to depict El Salvador or present El Salvador to foreigners in a very catchy way. They decided to include pictures, videos, uh, links to, official sites and uh, they also included a short video using um, sign language. Something curious is that that was not part of the problem. But one of my students said in sign language so that, you know, we address more people. And then I said, yes, but who's going to do it? He said, I will do it. I know it. So you see, Something that was not um, planned in the beginning was unintentionally presented, and that was. Here is another project. Um, this was developed with 
younger it, students and it was it, uh, the very first course here at UNICAES. So this is basic English. Um, I said, how do you present yourself uh, in a professional way using English? So students went uh, home with, the, with that idea Padlet, and we create our profile, and we include a picture, and we include our self, I mean, our own presentation. And this is what they did. Um, I would like to, I will share with you the website so that you see more of the projects. But once again, these are two ideas that you can uh, copy, that you can do. Last time I was presenting this, one of the teachers asked me, yeah, but you know what? My reality is different because my students are very young and uh, they do not have access to media or they have very restricted resources at home. Wait, you can copy this and you can make it happen using paper charts. So you ask your students to bring a picture of themselves and to have like uh, their self introduction in a written form and on a Friday they will sooner or later. Is this meaningful? Yes, because it's something that connects to them. And how am I making it more meaningful? By asking students to choose their best picture. We people like to be seen, right? And if you if I ask you to go in on, on your phone and check one of the pictures that you have there, I bet you will find one that you really like because it's yours. So this is how I made the task project more meaningful. Um, I just have a couple of minutes to close this up. Uh, key points that I want you to go home with today is that uh, instructions need to be very specific. So make sure when you explain the project or the situation, make sure your students understand what the situation is. Provide them with uh, feedback if it is needed. Number two, give students the freedom to, to choose. Uh, not just be you like the Beatles, you will ask students to bring something about the Beatles. Instead, you can ask students, who's your favorite? What's your favorite band? And you talk about your favorite band. See my point, you give students the chance to choose. Also, notice this, project-based shouldn't substitute your teaching, your teaching methodology at this point. So instead, it should add. This is how we use it here the project prompt is presented and then on friday students will present the result but mondays and wednesdays students will go to the classroom as they usually do right so do not uh do not change the whole method do not move into uh project based in I mean, do not move the whole session into a project-based learning method. Instead, use it as something different. Use it as something that your students will enjoy on a Friday. Um, also, projects should be scaffolded. You have to provide students with support along the way. They will go from very simple things to more sophisticated things, and they will need the support. Meaningful at the end of the day, what we want our students to do is to learn something that they will enjoy, something that they will use, and therefore something that will. These are just some ideas, but based on your context, based on your reality, you might want to see all the strategies you might want to see other um, uh, tasks that you can I remember what i said pbl is the method but then the materials the resources you choose them as the teacher um i don't want to close this presentation without showing you the uh the projects that i presented uh 
some minutes ago. So this is the Padlet. Uh, by the way, I asked my students for permission to show their pictures, so we're, we're fine. So see, you have pictures of people here and the, their introduction. Padlet is a very easy tool to use. Um, if you want more information about this, I will be sharing my email in just a minute so that you can send me an email and I will be more than happy to share with you tutorials on how to put your Padlet together if you don't know. But if you have used it, perfect. Why not keep on using it? Here is the other one that I presented and it's the website that I asked, that I told my students created. And here is the guy that I told you, I didn't know that this student could speak sign language or could, could, or knew sign language, and it was a total success. Once again, thank you so much for the invitation. It has been an honor for authorities for uh, investing in the teacher training opportunities. Uh, there is nothing more important than preparing teachers who are preparing our students so it's like a chain you give the resources to the teacher and those resources are diversified or are channeled into our students thank you so much and if you have questions we will be discussing them later thank you okay thank you professor ovidio for your interesting talk so you see you couldn't describe better the multiple contexts that we have here in we have just two questions here in the audience and the first one is gonna made by teacher Fidel Briseño. Teacher, we're listening to you. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. clearly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jose, for the presentation and I would like to ask, uh, taking in consideration the uh, website that your student did, which criteria you took in con into consideration to, ev to evaluate the students? based on that project um the criteria that i included in that particular one num was number one uh the relevance or how useful this was going to be um and let me tell you that other students uh, designed a application on their phone but it was not working by the time that they presented it also, some of the people decided to create a flyer, uh, but one of the limitations was that the flyer you print it, and you need to have that person face to face in order to deliver it. So, in the case of the website, it was very useful. It was very easy to share, and plus the creativity of students. Um, I was also checking for grammar, spelling, and language-related issues and uh those were part of my list of criteria that i used um we didn't mention this during the presentation but uh the project should be uh should seed by a criteria and students should know it before they start the project um, and that is also presented in the stage of presenting the prompt presenting the situation the students must know in the beginning what I will be looking for and therefore they will work toward those points so that will that will be my 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 suggestion over there hey, thank you mister for answering the question now we have another one from teacher Jahaira yes hi everyone yes just to contact Nicaragua we're working in seventh grade with multi-level learners. It's, as you know, we're going to implement a lot of activity like role play, interview, and also we're writing about these projects-based learning that's useful. We're going to try to do it, but do you have a example in your country how they are, your English teacher with 50 students, with, uh, sorry, with 50, um students and how we're going yep. yeah um, yes um so this is something good about project based and it is that uh since you promote collaborative work you uh 
can have like so many students working on a project at the same time because they will be working in small groups. Um, also with very young learners, I would call it that way, um, them for something very sophisticated. Uh, just to give you an example, yesterday there was a cultural event here uh, at Unicaes and a student present about food, Salvadorian food in English. Um, so students created charts using just paper, using markers and drawers and, and, and cut off uh, magazines and uh, we prepare a gallery walk so students had their charts all over the room and then they took a tour throughout the room each of the stations so by the time they got to station number one the group in charge of uh, station number one had five minutes to present their chart then once that was over they moved to the other station and so, so we had students presenting their projects uh, with very little resources and so many students at the same time. That would be, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. One more time. Just for ending up the talk, right? So as Teacher Yahaira said, we have many context in our country. Some teachers have uh, maybe 50, even 60 students in the same classroom, which is some teachers need to travel for hours to arrive the school. Some months ago, I was visiting some school around across the country, and I met a teacher who was traveling for four hours. Sometimes they feel exhausted just to finish. How would you encourage them to keep on and keep doing their best in order to teach students. All right. Um, just see the presentations of the students in the beginning of this uh, colloquium. I was so impressed on how coordinated they, they were and also their proficiency level. Um, teachers, you're you're absolutely making a great change. Uh, you have uh, in your classrooms the future of your country and the future of the world. Um, so even though you don't, you might not see the results right now, right away, these students will grow up and your teaching, your influence will be with them. So see that the role of a teacher does not end by the end of the lesson. It, it stays there forever. If not, please think back in time to and think of a teacher that you really admire. And I believe 90% of us have somebody who was our teacher that we felt very inspired and that we thanked him or her for something that we learned. So my piece of advice is, uh, teachers, you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, you have the power to make changes uh, in the future by giving your best, by providing your students with the best. Um, you never know when these students will grow up and will be your colleagues and not your students anymore. So that will be my, my final thought. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for addressing this interesting topic. It was a big pleasure, a, col a colossal hope. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Okay, so now, teachers, it's time to move on. We're going to continue with the pleasure to introduce some of the presenters that we have today. So, um, the first one, 
It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Anna Granger. She has a bachelor, a bachelor degree in teaching language and a master's degree in didactics of language learning in the west of England, University of Bristol. She is going to be talking about teacher's role in, the, in a differentiated classroom. We also have two very special guests for, from Minet. We have teacher Keren Azucena Romero Garcia. She is an English teacher in primary education here in Nicaragua. We also have the honor to count with the presence of teacher Sadie Rosales Quiroz. She is an English teacher in secondary education here in Nicaragua as well. They are going to talk about innovative strategies for differentiated instruction in the English classroom. Also, I would like to introduce Professor Marta Celia. She has a master in foreign language and a bachelor degree in teaching English. We are going to discuss about effective feedback for English learning process. And also we have the honor to come with Professor Jairo Hernandez Bermudez. He has a bachelor degree in teaching language, language teaching, and he is in charge of the language department at the, at the National Technological Institute in Atec in Nicaragua. So, as I told you before, we're discussing on regards to very interesting topics. So, we're going to begin with, um, we're going to begin with Professor Anna Granger. Can you hear me? Okay, teacher, so uh, we already know that you shared with us you have some problems with your voice, right? So, and you are making a great effort to be with us today and we really appreciate it. So we're going to do uh, a great effort too in order to share with you and to listen to you, right? Talking about a very important topic for teachers, uh, right? So what is our role as teacher in a different, right? So, and when it comes about the teacher's role, obviously one of them is identified what are our students' strengths and weaknesses, right? So the question to begin this discussion is how teachers identify the diverse learning needs of students in their classroom. Teacher, go ahead. I always start off by introducing all my vocabulary. So I have pictures that the children will look at and I will um, say the words in Spanish because I teach Spanish. I also teach, I'm a primary school teacher, so I teach our age between seven and 11 years old. And Excuse me. And um, we only have one hour a week teaching teaching a foreign language, so we don't have very much time to actually cover the curriculum well. <laughs> um, so I start with pictures, and I will look at really who sort of picks the vocabulary up quickly, and and then. I drill that vocabulary, so I drill it and keep drilling it so the children hear it many, many times and start to speak it. So sorry. So from there, I also provide, if I can share my screen. Yes, teacher, we are here, so we can listen to you. Um, tell me whether it let me share. Great. No, I don't think it will. But I provide sentence builders for the children. So I will build up my sentences so that they can take a chunk of vocabulary from the first paragraph. I'm sorry, then the second, and then the third to actually build up their sentences. And the children that need more support have got those to help them. But the children 
who are more able and encourage them or I will just take away some of the pot, maybe just a few words so that they can actually they can then actually um maybe I just have the first word of the sentence and I don't care if they have to try and remember what comes after that. So they always start off by listening. Then we introduce speaking. And then once we've done lots and lots of listening and speaking, then we'll move on to reading and writing. So we build so we have very, very slowly. What I don't like doing is setting different topics or different tasks, sorry, for different groups of children. So I won't say this group here you really need to do this easier task, this group here, the middle task, and this group, the more difficult task. Because I feel that that caps the learners what they can actually achieve. So if you say to them, you can do this activity, and give them that chance to have a go at actually challenging themselves. And I will usually give them maybe three or four activities, the first one being the easiest, the next one being a little bit more difficult, the third one being more difficult still, and then the last one being a real challenge. And they will all start on the easier activity. And then have a go, if they if they finish that one, have a go at the next activity, yes. And I think children are really good at actually differentiating themselves as well. As well. So they'll know whether this is called extensive processing instruction and it's it's something that was devised by um an italian called Gianfranco conti i can put the information in the chat in just a few minutes and excuse me and this is really based on drilling drilling vocabulary on children are just starting to learn so that they've got those structures in their heads, so not just teaching individual words, but teaching structures. So, for example, in my classroom at the moment, my year six children are doing a city in and we're learning to say what there is in the different towns. So, in Coventry, they've learned how to say, in Coventry, there are two cathedrals. There are lots of shops. In Coventry, there are some parks. And then in Malaga, we've learned how to say things like, in Coventry, there is one cathedral. In Coventry, um, there are lots of museums. So the more able children start to be able to see how you can change individual sections. The chunk of of sentences. So for example, instead of just saying there is in Coventry there is one cathedral, they could change it and say in Malaga there are two cathedrals. cathedrals. And in Coventry there are lots of shops. In Malaga there are lots of parks. And then I will give them some conjunctions. So we'll learn how to say and, but however um things like that. So that the, the more able children can actually start to make their sentences longer. So they can say, in Coventry, there are two cathedrals. However, in Malaga, there is only one cathedral. Whereas the less able children, those that find it a little bit more difficult, can actually talk about what there is in Coventry, what there is in Malaga. But actually, They've got those structures in their head because we have drilled them so many times. Times. And, oh, excuse oh, excuse me. Me. So they've drilled them so many times, but actually encouraging them the more they want to actually to, add, to actually to extend their sentences, and even then to write not just a sentence but a paragraph. So, so how I. How I sort of structure my um, my differentiated classroom. classroom. As I say, I can show you some of my builders, builders. but I'm not sure if I can actually share my screen. I don't think it's letting me share my screen at the moment. 
And would you would you like me to to see if I can show you some examples? Okay, thank you, Miss. So we were listening to you, and uh, something important that you said was related with uh, the tasks that the students need to perform in the classroom, right? Teachers need to begin with the easier tasks and then move into the most difficult one, which is scaffolding, right? But you see our motto here in the Ministry of Education is no learner left behind, right? So if the students are not acquiring the competencies, are not developing the skills in a proper way, how will we um, uplift them in order to achieve the competencies, but also trying to do not stop the other students that are acquiring the competencies required, right? So, you know. Really true, that's What would you suggest? Sorry, sorry. So, through that structure, Structured learning. So, centers, so the children of my class, they all have their individual, their own booklets, which I gave them at the beginning of the year. That's all of the centers build us in, build us in. Let's just see if I can share. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Easy to show you. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Sorry. Thank you, teacher. And so uh, now we are going to move on to share the experience of one of one of our Nicaraguan teachers here. To keep online because at the end of the discussion we will have some intervention from the department. Right? Some teachers want to ask you some questions. So keep online. So we're going to listen. Uh, just uh, let me see. We're going. To we're going to listen to teacher Keren Azucena Romero Garcia and to teacher Sadie Rosales Quiroz. They are going to share some innovative strategies that they are have applied for differentiated instruction in the English classroom. So teachers, welcome one more time. So the audience is yours. Good morning, teachers online and it's my pleasure to be here sharing some of my experiences, some of my practices during my teaching years with Minette. And I have seen that in the classroom we have different kind of students, two of the same type of music, they have but, but they had different in interests and also they had different abilities some of them like to draw and they draw very well better than myself and some like singing and have a good voice to sing they like listening to music and they learn from all the abilities that they have we can have the kinesthetic students that they can learn through the movement. For example, if we play a song, they will move and learn vocabulary through the movement of their body. For example, I have applied surgery that when I'm teaching parts, I tell them to move and they move and sing along. So that type of learning, I'm targeting in that way the type of learners because they are kind of extending, they learn through movement. We have another type of learner as well. We had the one that are musical. I has, I has said before that they learn through music, listening to a song, for example, head, shoulder, knees, and toes, and they move as well, but they sing and they learn that vocabulary. And that's for the little ones. Moving to the higher levels, for example, in sixth grade, they can write text, if they are intelligent students, they can write texts about topics that they like. For example, we have last year, and also it was a topic in the textbook that we use, a cartoon that they like, or a famous person. And they, they did a great job writing, they, most of them, and enjoyed that task because they write about something that, that they enjoy, like cartoons of a famous person. To be more, more specific, 
we cannot target all type of learnings on one lesson, but we can try. We can try to target, for example, at once the one that are mathematical, logical students. We can target the ones that are musical. I will structure the lesson plan, and I had done this before in this way, just to for put into context to you, and you get an idea about what what we are doing and what we can do and improve our teaching practices. For example, if I'm going to teach to second graders about the the animals vocabulary, and I will start with a song where they can sing and they can move about animals. Uh, kids at this age, they really love singing and moving. They love that. And after that, I'm going to pro proceed with presenting the vocabulary with some flashcard to get the vis to target the visual students that learn through visual aids, learn the vocabulary, and I'm also introducing the topic as a teacher. I'm going to the complex, to the simple tasks, to the complex. And then we, I can assign to them in the same lesson plan, and the same lesson, I can assign to them, and they can draw their favorite animals. And after they do that, they can present it. So I'm targeting different type of students, at least, and not all of them because uh, in 40 to 45 minutes time flies, we know that. But we are doing the best to target the most variety of, of learnings in the lesson. And after that, I can continue with the second lesson in another session, and I can teach them on the same topic, the vocabulary, because we had a week, we had three sessions, and we continue with the topic about animals, and I can play background sounds about, for example, a lion roaring, and or a cow mewing, or a dog barking, so they can listen to the sound, identify this, the animal. Oh, it's the lion that is roaring. Oh, it's the cat, and they enjoy that activity. It's, it can sing as a simple activity, but they really enjoy it because they are not only writing and sitting down, they are using their sense to learn. So I, in that way, I'm addressing the students. And I can proceed to tell them to move their body. For example, I can tell, now do the shape of a lion, and they can do this. Uh, do the... The elephant, and they know that the elephant have a, a big, a big uh, mouth there, so they can do the movement. And so, in this way, I am I said, I'm teaching to targeting sorry to the kinesthetic students. I target the musical, and I target the kinesthetic students. So. In this way, I'm explaining to you how in a lesson plan we can go and try to assess the most of variety of learnings that we have. And then I can proceed and have them to work in group with a digital puzzle, for example, about animals. And I can assign them to them different type of animals and they can, and they, pieces of the Jesus puzzle, and after that they finish the, the Jesus puzzle that is formed, they can present it to the classmate. They, they, ha they love presenting the work because in that way you can say, good job, and we can work as well in the conference of the kids with the language and also the self-esteem. Research, there are eight type of learning, so it is important to know that because we know which strategy work well with the student? Some students are not good writers, but they are good at singing, they are good at moving, they are good at drawing. So we can implement that, and the kids won't feel frustrated when he can achieve um, writing a text. 
but he, he can learn vocabulary and grammar can have variety. The key in the, the, key in the French sharing classroom is to have variety in the strategies. So we, we can do our best. I mean, I know we are doing our best because we saw in the presentation that the kids were amazing, the pronunciation was on point. So the good, the good job teachers in primary school, we are doing a good job, but we can improve because there are always room for improvement. And that is my intervention. Okay, thank you, teacher mm -hmm. Karen, for your intervention. Thanks for your experience as an English teacher in primary schools, right? So I assume you are, you have been working for almost six years for the ministry, right? Or how long have you been teaching as an English teacher? In, with this year, it will be five years. Excellent, very good, nice experience. So you see, now here we have English teacher in secondary education. What can you tell us about your experience on applying innovative strategies for differentiated instructions in your English classroom, Miss? So good morning, everyone. Um, well, I'm thrilled to share a little bit of my experience regarding the teaching of English, the English language in high school. To me, it has been a great experience and I'm really happy to be here to share a little bit of that because I do respect all instructors here and the ones online. So uh, I think that we are in this, that we learned. So one of the things that I consider first is well, to have a list of 10 aspects or let's say criteria for me as an instructor to to teach my learners. So right here, I have some of them, but I will give you some little details about it. So it has been mentioned before the presentation we had, and it says that we need to get to know our students and their learner needs, interests, and strength. So that will be the first thing. So I cannot think of a specific strategy. Uh, I can have the topic, but I cannot think of singing in the classroom, maybe dancing, kind of warm up activity until I get to know with my students. So I need to identify the kind of strengths they have, the weaknesses, you know. So I think that's really important. And that is the first thing we need to know. Then I have to plan and prepare a variety of learning activities that are appropriately challenging for my students. It, okay, so the lesson plan, it is not about me. It is not about what I want to, to get at the end. Of course, I have my objectives as an instructor, but I also need to work based on my students' needs. So I'm monitoring that in the classrooms, of course. So you observe what your students do. Sometimes, you know, something really important that we all need to consider is this. Like us right now, to be honest, and with respect, we sometimes get distracted with the use of cell phones. I know this is really important because we can use technology, you know, we can adapt this. Ah, but what about what is that students are doing at the moment you are completing an activity. So let's make sure that if you're not completing online activities, for example, I have done, let's say, or applied some online service, or I have my students complete online live worksheets that depends on the topic that I'm teaching. I'm someone who really likes to implement songs in the classrooms. I'm not a let's singer, but I really like to sing. So I invite my students, you know, to be part of this activity. Of course, as you all mentioned before, sometimes you have students and they are not like, oh, miss, forget it. I don't like singing. I won't do that. It's fine. So you can be part of the audience. So I, I don't have them like maybe singing, but they can do something different while someone else is singing in the classrooms. So we can use a pre-assessment to determine what the students already know and what they need to learn. So that's also important. Okay, so what is that that I, the new challenges I have as an instructor and also the things that the students can also share with us. It is not only about me to share, okay, I'm the instructor, I'm going to share all what I know because it's not that way. So we can also create flexible groups based on the students interest and learning us let's offer a variety of resources you've me mentioning this like in primary schools you know uh, reading tasks uh, maybe talent shows i love that so students are able to show what they are able to do right 
it is not just about singing, as I mentioned before, but some students are really good at acting. Some students are really good at reading. You know, even in Spanish, we don't respect punctuations. My gosh, it is always a challenge. I have a students, really good students that, that love saying tongue twister, you know, like in Spanish, they are very challenging. So, but they have fun, they enjoy doing this during the class time. So I think that's really important. Let's provide clear and specific instructions for each activity and make sure students understand expectations. I would like to, let's say, remark something important here. It doesn't matter the kind of activity you're going to implement in the class, but every time we do that, what I do is like check. You know, the most common question is, do you guys understand? Is that guy is clear? And students say, yes. Okay, so you let them work and that's all. I'm not saying that everybody, but that has happened to me. So then I need to confirm that my students understood what I asked for. So if it's just a simple reading, so dear students, here we have a simple reading about, let's say a beautiful turtle. Okay, so students will read about that. But what is that that I need them to do? First, okay, identify the picture, okay? Then, okay, let's read a little bit for some minutes. No words, wow, new words in the reading? Yes, miss, okay, let's identify those words. And then I have my students share, okay? This word in the text. So they share, they compare, if they say, I don't know, Okay, let's learn together. And there we are to give, you know, directions to our students to monitor them. So our role when talking about differentiated strategies is that monitor what students are doing. Okay, so let them be the main, let's, the ones that are in charge of their own learning process. Okay, so I know we implement different strategies, but let them work. And you know what, dear instructors, um, when it comes to mistakes, how do that when students make mistakes? Sometimes some instructors or educators focus on adding low grades. So I'm sorry, that was not pretty good. Yuck. Zero. No, no, maybe zero, maybe 50 or 30 out of 100. But it doesn't matter. Let's our students make mistakes. To be honest, to me, that's not like something really bad or they're going to die just because of that. No, actually, to me, I strongly believe that that is one of the greatest opportunities to make our learners learn and improve, create a new methodology, including, let's say, um, a strategy to learn and improve the English process. So it's important to keep that in mind. As students feel shy, but let's have them participate in the class and let's motivate them. Let's do it all the time and of course. So I wanna invite you this morning to work on that. Let's implement more differentiated strategies in our classrooms to, you know what, monitor our students and also foster it to English language, no matter what, okay? Thank you so much. A very good thanks, teacher Sadie, for sharing with us those tips that are highly and remarkably important for our pedagogical practice as teacher, right? So I was wondering, so you see last year we've ended up with the first generation of students graduating from sixth grade. So now those students are in seventh grade. Some of them came from schools where they learned English, but some others didn't, right? What is the special treatment that can we provide to those students that are not in the same level of English proficiency, right? In order to be inclusive, right, with them. By the way, challenging. <laughs> I would say that, well, so we identified the students. Uh, now I know the kind of students that I'm gonna have or that I have in the classrooms. So then I really work with body language. So I love that. I can say, okay, let's sing, but just like this, no, let's sing. So I do it. So I use body language all the time. Um, I know because the idea is to use English all the time. Sometimes you can do like maybe a little bit of, you know, the native language, use the different stuff you have in the classroom. So you monitor students' interaction. And of course, there is something important here. We can help ourselves 
by selecting some students that, let's say, are really good with the language, we can pair them, we can have them work in groups, so we have those students as monitors in the group. So is that to also make sure that they are working together and of course always checking for comprehension absolutely will so i hope you're taking notes of those tips because they are going to be a everyday pedagogical practice so re teachers remember we will have some interventions from the department later but now we're going to continue listen listening to professor marta celia laguna uh, she's going to be talking about um providing feedback to the students, right? Taking into consideration differentiated instruction, right? So teacher, Marta Celia, can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay. Teacher. Yes. okay, thanks teacher for joining us. A pleasure, a colossal honor having you with us today. So the audience is yours. Thank you so much. I would like to say welcome from Leon, um, specifically. I would like to share my humble experience when giving feedback to our students here at the university. But this feedback is useful for at any level. So the topic I'm going to be sharing with you is effective feedback for the English language learning process. I would like to get started with a simple well, some series of questions just for reflection. The first one is, do we give, do we really give our students feedback? If so, how? And if you do it, or if, is it effective for our students? Does it work? Do you see that there's some improvement in our students' learning experience? Or it's just a learning just for a moment, like when they are having a quiz or a test. So how effective is it? So first, let's see what, what's meant by feedback. And given feedback is the information that we professors give to our students. This, the idea of doing this is just to make sure that our students are actually knowing, understanding where they are of the process of learning and how they are performing the activity class. And the last thing is what to do with what they are learning. So if it's not so good, what's next? What would be the suggestion for them to improve? So one of the ways that we can make sure that our students are learning effectively and uh, through our field because it's something that we're facilitators and we're guiding their learning experience. So one of those ways is that our feedback needs to be specific. The other one is that it has to be targeted. And the last one, it has to be timely. The first one is specific. That means we find the, the previous professor, I think that her name is Sadie, if I'm not mistaken, was talking about identifying our students' strengths and weaknesses. And that's important just to show our students that they can identify that they have strengths, they have a strength in their learning process, but also there may be some weaknesses, some certain types of aspects which they need to polish. That, that's something I would call, or I would tell my students, that would be the way I would, I would tell them, you just need to polish these specific areas in your way of speaking, if it's a class about speaking. So, if it's specific, students would need to understand what to do next. So you would tell them, well, this is an area you have to monitor, of area you're teaching them. If it's grammar, some of the professors were talking about grammar. So what, how can they monitor or how can they want at least improve in that area? Or if it's pronunciation, so how can, what, what can they, what can they do specifically to improve that area? So how can we help them guiding, guiding their learning? But also we get started by guiding students, but it's important that at some moment they are responsible for their learning. So there should be some type of controlling at the beginning, some controlling stage, but then they should be dependent in their learning process. So not everything needs to be done by the professor. It's, it's a work that can be done by students themselves. 
So we guide them on how to improve their learning. And how can we do that? Well, we need to implement certain types of strategies when we are monitoring how they are speaking, how they are writing, depending on the level they have. And that's that's what takes us to the second point I was mentioning before. And it's when we, the learning is targeted, the feedback we provide is targeted. That means it's appropriate for our students' level. If they are children, then we need to know how to provide feedback to our children. It will be different from the way we would provide feedback to, to stimulate when students are doing something good. But it's not only when they are doing something good, it's also giving them suggestions or providing them with the tools so they can improve. If they are not doing something wrong, we need to mark their phases and just tell them and you get five out of 10, but also telling them, this is what you have to do in order to improve, to do better. So we have to guide them at some point. That would be one way. And we need to be respectful when targeting our students. We need to be respectful. Not everything that they do is wrong. If they are in a specific level, it's because they got there, because they, they deserve it. It's because they actually learned something previously. So they got to a specific type of level. And then we need to make sure that we're not judgmental and just to give them the chance for improvement. So there are some other strategies. I will be mentioning some of them at the end. We need to restrain judgment, like this is bad or it's a zero. It's not only that, it's just a way also to give them the, the chance so they can improve, some, some chance for improvement. And then, the last thing is timely. It's when we give feedback, it has to be at the moment. It cannot be at the end of the semester or when you finish one midterm. It's just that they actually need and receive a specific type of support. That's the moment they need to be given the feedback where they got something wrong or where they got some something good if it's a strength. So that's what's meant by timely. When something that's happening, we are actually making a correction at the right moment. So that's why I'm mentioning it has to be very specific. So we need to tell them this is good, but this is wrong, and which is the area they need to actually correct and how they have to correct, correct that area. So we need to provide suggestions for improvement. And then targeted, and that means we have to be respectful according to the level of students. And how can we do that? It could be through several different ways. One of them is called extrinsic motivation, which is like with the children, we use stickers. But then we, you can also do it through many other means, which may go through a process, like students are editing their assignments and getting better and better uh, as we are testing their, their performance. And well, there are some types of feedback we can give. One is elicitation. This is the one that we do most of the time. It's when student, a student makes a mistake and we just correct the student. Sometimes we fall in, into the temptation, I have to say that, that we correct students immediately after they make a mistake. This is something that's wrong because if we do it in front of everyone, then that's something that, that's not so good. We can fall into bullying nowadays. That's the way it's known nowadays. And then we have to be careful. And we can make a correction immediately if you want to, but not so directly. So let's say a student and the student says, I, what, one of the commonest types of mistakes, students say, I am agree. And then we can ask them, do you agree? Do you mean you agree? So you agree. So students, students can understand indirectly, not like saying, no, oh, that's wrong. You don't say, I am agree. You say, I agree. So instead of doing it like that, so explicit, it's important that we use other strategies that are not so offensive for students. We need to be more respectful with our students. And then that's elicitation. That's one type of feedback. Another one is that we can make explicit corrections, but it's, for example, when we, we can do that at the end of the class, if students were presenting something, 
at the end of the class, we put some of the mistakes. We can have them even correct those mistakes by themselves. So they can say, this is something wrong. If it's grammar, this is this is not good. This is the way it's corrected. You can give them the power, not only the professor or the teacher doing everything, but reflect on the experience and think about what would be the possible way they can correct, self-correct that type of mistake they made. And another type of, of, of feedback is repetition, which is something that you don't do it just once a day. You do it every day through different types of exercises. But it's an exercise that's meaningful. It shouldn't be in isolation. So Professor Ovidio Torres was talking a, a little bit about it, like con contextualizing the, the exercises, the, acti the activities. So that's something that's very important. So repetition, that would include some activities in which students would be taking the chance to participate in certain types of activities, specifically that have to do with a type of mistake they made at some point, so they can internalize the correct way to say something. And then there are some types of strategies we can apply in our language classes in order to give our students feedback and they can be monitoring and controlling and also self-assessing their instructions or their learning process and one of them is when we have them like having in a pair and give feedback to each other about how to correct something that could be for example you have them sit together and discuss about an issue they have traveled with if it's pronunciation, how can you improve specific type of pronunciation? Let's say that's simple past and you're teaching simple past to teenagers. How would you improve this particular pronunciation? Each, what would you do to correct that mistake? First, obviously, there should be some guide by the teacher, and that means you need, you need to explain some other, and then have them students apply what would be the correct way to pronounce something in past or how to pronounce endings, which may be an issue for our students. Another strategy could be the use of portfolios, especially when you're teaching writing to your students. And if you are teaching them how to write a sentence or a paragraph, you can have them create a, a type of portfolio where once you mark their first draft, then students can find where their strength is and what their mistakes and have give them the chance to correct these exercises, these assignments. Another way could be when they can self-assess as well. But here we need to provide them with some rubrics, some type of guidance. So what's meant by what, what am I expecting from them? to what level they have to get to. And that means if we're, I'm testing an oral presentation, then I would need to think about what content students are presenting. And if the ideas are clearly presented, if they are well organized, if the vocabulary is just in English or they are using Spanish, or sometimes they may use in Spanish. And if need to provide them some type of rubrics, some types of criteria of evaluation, so they can also say and decide, this is what I deserve, and give them the responsibility so they can also find which is their strength and weakness. And the last thing is to have a class discussion. So all the class discussing on an issue that you identified, and it's really change, especially because you couldn't reach a goal and that goal had to do with having students apply specific type of structure and you couldn't achieve it. And that's why it's important that Professor Sadie, I think she was saying that it's not good, and I totally agree with her, it's not good to ask our students, do you understand? Because they will always say yes, no matter if they are 
in the classroom. They may be with their minds, their brains on Facebook or doing some, thinking about something else. And they may not necessarily understand what the question should be. What do you understand? And having students put into action what specific structure you were guiding them on how to or you were explaining to them in the classroom so that, that's why it's important so those are some of the strategies we can use to to have our students take more responsibility when giving them feedback and why is it important to give feedback as professors it's not only just to tell them this is wrong or this is just just a much you got five out of ten it's not only that for students ownership it gives, it gives them responsibility and confidence because they will know this is where I am at. This is my strength, but also this is my weakness. And I can do this if this is my weakness. So they have some responsibility that's necessary. So this is my, my humble presentation on how to give feedback to our students so they can get a better performance in the language class. Thank you very much for paying attention to, to this humble presentation. Thank you, Professor Laguna, for addressing that interesting topic for our teachers across the country, right? So you mentioned something really important, and it is that feedback needs to be uh, specific and it needs to be aligned with the students' goals, right? Later, we're going to receive some questions from different area, uh, areas of the country, so please uh, keep online, right? Thank you one more time, Mrs. Yes. Marta Laguna. A pleasure to listen to you. Now we're going to continue with Mr. Jairo Hernandez Bermudez, as we, will, we were telling you before, he is in charge of the language department at Inatec, and he is going. He is going to be talking about how do we use technology in a differentiated instruction approach. The audience is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a question before answering the question. <laughs> uh, are you hungry? <laughs> it's almost. It's almost a long time. <laughs> it's 11, 11, 27, almost 12, no problem. Um, I'm going to be brief, all right? No problem, not too much time. I won't take too much time. So students, administrators uh, that are in this conference, in this event, in this national uh, colloquium, all right? And also, I want to, con to say congratulations to all of you because you're doing a really good effort. Everybody in each school is working really hard with primary school students, secondary school students, and this is really, is, is really, um, is really worthy because we know that we're teaching English because we want to see our nation grow, all right? So congratulations to everybody for this really uh, worthy mission we have at a national level, okay? And I think you deserve a... I will ask you to give us and give them give all teachers students a big applause because you deserve it you deserve it thank you and also i want to motivate you okay to continue to continue with this uh hard working process in order to teach our students english um okay i want to make this integrated so i just want to mention something about uh, uh some uh, information that i just I took some notes from the previous lecture and I wrote something about difficulties we have when teaching. Uh, you were mentioning large, large classes with very limited instructions, right? Also, you were mentioning about lack of resources. And also, you were mentioning something about students with different proficiency levels in a single classroom, which is it's true. It's really true. Also, you were talking about based learning which is like a proposal to uh, integrate all students in, in a whole project and, and to make them work together. It doesn't matter the amount of students you have because you were asking, okay, how many students can I have in one, in one classroom? So I think this, this proposal, project-based learning, um, many, many students, many students. And okay, but now, Coming to the question, what's the role of technology? Okay, 
you were mentioning a little bit about technology over here as well. Um, and it's a really good question. Technology plays an important role. Poor. Listen to this. To support teachers and students in the learning process. Since technology is eye-catching. You see? When using, for example, a smartphone, we can see uh, beautiful colors. We can interact with each other. Uh, we can use the internet connection to send messages. We can use internet connection to audios. And all these elements are part of technology, right? And why don't we use technology in the classroom? If we have all these advantages, all these resources. So technology is eye-catching. And I think students are going to feel motivated of using technology to receive instructions. They're gonna feel motivated. Let's, let's put an example. Let's see, let's suppose that we have a, a big classroom, all right? And everybody there, they have cell phones, correct? I think it's gonna be better for them, for they, to, um, to ask them to open, to open uh, a file and see the instructions there. Or send an audio, for example. Everybody can have a cell phone over here and I can send an audio and you are going to be able to listen to the audio at the same time using your use, using your headphones, for example. And it's going to be the class is going to be different. I think that's one way to use technology in the classroom. I have done it before. I have done it in secondary school education. I have done it in the university. And I think students feel motivated when using the cell phone, of course. We have to manage, we have to organize the classroom, we have to have a good classroom management, all right? But I think technology help or other, or other countries and they want to invest in our country right now. So, and I, I'm really sure, I'm totally sure that they're gonna bring technology into the classroom. So we have to adapt ourselves to use technology, okay? So I was mentioning that students can receive these instructions in different ways, for example, through a text message, through an audio, through a picture, and so on. Okay, um, regarding this, technology save us time, okay? Because it's, it's better to send an instruction with one click. And everybody's gonna get the instruction immediately, like this, by using the, con the internet connection. Instead of be explaining and explaining on a whiteboard, and it, it's, it's, um, it takes a lot of time. So, save us time, technology save us time, motivate students, and allows the teacher to organize the learning activities in a better way. Okay, that's something that I wanted to mention about. Example, there are different apps that you can use to have questions already entered, and then the students can choose an answer and they can set it come up on the screen, okay? For example, you can pick up um, the correct questions and, uh, and immediately, at the moment, you can see the answers in a, in a projector, for example. And at that moment, you can provide feedback because you were mentioning feedback. And it's gonna be, the feedback is gonna be immediately at the moment. So everybody is gonna be part of the activity, checking the answers, the good answers, the wrong answers, and you can provide information feedback, which is really good. Also, uh, now with the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, we're talking about the sociolinguistic part or the sociolinguistic competencies that students should acquire. So technology can help us to get these competencies. How? Remember, with technology, we can use different audios from dif using different accents, correct? how people in Australia talk, how people in, in China talk, how people in, in the United States talk. So, and we're gonna have this sense, but only with technology, because we have, um, let's say, an accent, correct? Nicaraguan accent or, or in a standard accent, but it's not the same to be listening to other native speakers. Our students have to, they have to get exposed to the, to the, to the language, how it is used. So that's why we have to take advantage of technology. Don't be afraid of technology. That's the role of technology. And, and let's have a good classroom management. That's all. To, to, because we have to, of course, keep the control of our classroom. 
But I think in my own experience, technology has helped a lot, has helped me a lot, and I have seen many good results when using technology. Thank you, teacher Jairo, for your intervention. So you see, technology is, is remarkably important in our everyday life, right? So even more in education. So you see, guys, it's time for your intervention from the areas, from the different areas of the So we will have questions from Carazo, from the Caribbean coast, coast also from Madrid. So are you ready, guys? We're going to start with the teachers from um, Carazo. Are you ready? Remember, so you're going to tell us your questions, your job, and one of our presenters is going to answer. Okay, teachers from Carazo, can you hear us? Hello, are you there teachers? So, while teachers are connected, we're going to continue with Teachers from the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, they have a question for our presenters. Teachers? Hello, lady. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes, absolutely. Okay, teacher, go ahead. What's your question? Good to see you. First of all, it's a pleasure to receive such vital information that was shared from everyone. And I have a question that I would like to ask. What professional development Okay, so thank you, teacher, for your question. I think what professional development opportunities or resources have helped you to enhance your skills in the classroom? That's right? Yes. Yeah, so I think one uh, this question is for you, Ms. Sadio, for you, Ms. Keren. So what professional opportunities or development um, are you gathering from differentiated instruction? How this approach help you in your everyday pedagogical practice? Because we are helping our students, but also while we are helping our students, we are getting eliciting experience. That, how this approach can help you? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, as I mentioned before, from everything so um, it is not just because we are teaching now we also get some incomes from our students and I think I have learned a lot from all of them you know especially as I mentioned before when my students perform an activity and maybe they are not let's say getting the the right answer or what I was expecting and I will come up with new ideas to implement the classroom. So I have learned a lot from them and I think I'm still growing, also improving the language because this is not our native language, so we will always have challenges. Say that learning from our students it's something amazing of course and we're going to continue growing. We're gonna continue growing. So I have learned my English skills have improved a lot of course that also in my students' performance. So how or when, when they interact, when they make, or let's say, short conversation. To listen to you and to see you again. Thank you. So, okay, we are going to listen to teachers from Dirian Bacarazzo. They already have the question. Okay, good afternoon. Good morning, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this incredible colloquium. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for all of you the information that you provide. It was useful, meaningful, 
Uh, so regarding to this, I would like to ask you one question. The question says, how do you ensure that all our students are challenged and engaged at their proper level? Okay, thank you, Mr. Christian from Carazo, right? Yes. Okay, thanks for your question. So how do we ensure that all students are engaged and involved, right, at their proper level? So, can okay, you read? We can engage students, and as I mentioned we before, we hide diversity in the classroom. We can engage them by providing variety of strategies, and also not only applying one strategy during the lesson, multiple strategies. So we can target all of the students, or the majority of them, and in that way they can enjoy the lesson, and they can feel engaged and motivated to learn. So the answer is the variety of the strategies in one lesson. Okay, thank you, uh, teacher Karen, for your appreciation, for your intervention. So how do we ensure that all students are engaged and involved during the learning process? Okay, so you, you already listened to, to the question, right? Right. Do we um, ensure that all students are engaged, are involved? What can you tell us? Yeah. Right. One thing that really works is keeping students busy or giving students a role in... We develop tasks in our classroom but we think only about those students who are well prepared have a specific proficiency level and sometimes we do not consider once again my, my piece of advice would be every time you design a task no matter which one no matter if it is in class or outside the classroom you assign roles to your students um, and second thing that i would suggest is once again, uh, making it meaningful. Let's look for uh, tasks that will personally to students. And one way to do that is uh, bringing authentic tasks, something that, as I said in my presentation, something that is likely to happen in real life for students. For example, going on a job interview or ordering food, real in English. Um, I also want to take just a couple of seconds to uh, add the first question, and it's about professional development opportunities for teachers. Um, why not thinking about a community of practice? Now with technology, it is really easy to form a, I don't know, a Facebook group where you gather teachers from the whole country in where teachers can share their experiences. Um, I don't know you, but in my case, as an English teacher, mostly what I do is I copy good. Some teachers uh, have developed activities that I like them. So what I do is I just bring the idea to my class and implement it. So there is no, uh, I mean, th there is a very uh, strong a sense of community and it is very, uh, you know, appropriate for sharing. We learn from other colleagues, so creating a community of practice will be a really good idea. Great teacher, absolutely. So now we're going to listen to teachers from Madrid. So they are going to be asking to teacher Marta Celia Laguna. Teachers from Madrid, what's your question? Teachers, are you there? Hello, teacher. Hello, nice to listen to you. Hello, it's a pleasure to interact with you, teachers. My name is Tatiana, and I'm going to ask, how do you use the formative assessment results to inform your feedback and adjust your instructions and pedagogical practices accordingly? Tatiana, so, 
Teacher Marta Celia Laguna, are you there? Can you help us to answer that question? How do we use the formative assessment results, right? Which is the type of assessment we are implementing in the Ministry of Education to inform your feedback. That we can use a type of rubric in which students can take a, a role, an active role. So students can identify which is their weakness and their strength. And we're just guiding, guiding those students. So we tell them, this is what I'm going to be testing. You have to reach this level. So if what I'm testing is content, how many ideas students have to provide? So there should be some type of rubric and students would need to know what I'm expecting them, where they have to get to. So there should be a goal, obviously, that we need to follow. And that's something that we need to tell students since the very beginning of their learning experience. So it's, we're testing what it is that we're going to be testing from the very beginning. It's like when we are negotiating with our two one instead of five in the rubric, let's say I'm talking about content, um, I'm supposed to have my students to present something and then it's an oral presentation so how to go from one to five so what they have to do so we need to provide with very clear suggestions and guide, guide students in the process so it's not going to be from one day to the other so that's why it's formative so we need to make sure that it's a plan that's taking them to guarantee that they get to the five and if they cannot accomplish that, then we need to give them the chance to self-correct. In the case, I'm, I was talking about feedback, how to provide effective feedback. How can we guarantee our students learning through effective feedback? So that would be one way, using rubrics, but also using that's judgmental. The idea is that students learn and they don't feel threatened when they are learning. So it has to be through positive reinforcement. So we, there are so many different ways we can provide positive reinforcement as well. From simple things like clapping in the classroom, that we are giving them candy if they are doing something really good or giving them a sticker. It depends on the, the, the pH of the student. But it's a whole thing. So I'm doing that since the very beginning and until the end the semester or midterm, we just need to make sure that we guarantee that that's happening. So we need to evaluate their progress, how they are doing their progress. I don't know if I'm actually answering your question, Tatiana. Thank you, teacher Marta, nice answer. So I hope you teachers, all of you are taking notes of those important aspects, right? So now it's time to hear teachers from Chinandega. They are gonna be asking a question to teacher Jairo in regard to technological devices and how do we implement them into our classroom for differentiated instruction. Teachers from Chinandega, are you there? Hi there, everyone. Hello, Hi, mister. Everyone. Nice to see you. What's your... Um, we're very glad from Prosotea um, listening to all your presentations. Receive big, huge uh, regards and mahog from us. A, I'm very flabbergasted for all your presentation of professional and national presenters. We're very glad about it. So Nick, my question is, for Mr. Mr. Javier, Mr. Jairo. So you were talking about some idea, some details of how to um, implement some techniques and strategies to let our students work. Use digital platforms or learning management systems to address the different styles and rhythms in classrooms and what evaluation techniques and instruments could we implement to evaluate the already competence competences achieved by students okay thank you teacher teacher Jairo. yeah <laughs> thank you so much for the question teacher thank you 
Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the experience. Three days ago, we were evaluating teachers at a national level, uh, primary school teachers and secondary school teachers, and we were using technology, okay? We were using uh, an online platform we have. We evaluated two skills. We evaluated uh, and the reading skill. Technology helps, helps us to evaluate these skills automatically because you can upload an audio and you only have to uh, choose the correct, select the correct option, okay? It could be reading or listening. But how about writing? How about speaking? Because they're productive, productive skills. Do it online, but through a video conference like this one, um, we use the cell phone, for example, we, we make a phone call. And also in a tech, the National Technological Institute is implementing a strategy uh, with Oxford University Press, which is almost the same, to evaluate reading and listening automatically with an online platform, and also the speaking and, and it's different. At this moment, we don't have um, any software that evaluate, let's see, speaking automatically because it doesn't exist. It could be a voice recognition, but it's not 100% sure. So we have to still work with some specialists. Um, technology is really um, important because it, as I was mentioning before, uh, we don't need too much time to evaluate, of course. Also, I just want to add something to, to the question. Um, like what things do we need to implement technology uh, in our schools, okay? There should be a policy that guarantee technological equipment and internet connection in each school because we understand that there are some communities that they don't have internet yet, okay? Be working with these communities in order to be implementing technology. Let's see the Caribbean coast, for example. So they need more technology in order to evaluate them, in order to implement all these things about technology. We have to provide them first with all these equipment. I'm talking about computers. I'm talking about uh, internet connection. I'm talking about projectors. In Inatech, for example, uh, we, we have 61 technological centers. And all of these technological centers, uh, we have at least computers, uh, projector, and internet connection. And also we install a uh, software. And with this software, you can evaluate. You can also interact with students. Um, it's, you have a, a really good, a beautiful graphic design. And they are able to interact with the teacher and all the rest of students. Okay, so, but in order to do so, I think, I think we have to first analyze the conditions we have right now at a national level, and then to try to reinforce all those areas that need more technology. Thank you, teacher Jairo. So I think all our, all of, all of our teachers can join to the courses that Inatec has, right? In order to develop their competencies on using technology. So teachers, as a conclusion, we want to say thank you to all of you for joining us today. Such a great pleasure. We learned a lot about how to provide differentiated instructions to our students, taking into account that all of styles, but keeping into consideration that all of them have the right to a, an education with quality. And that is our role as teachers in the classroom. Ensure that all our students are learning, are developing competencies on English language. So thank you one more time. A pleasure being sharing with all of you, teacher, also video teacher Ann Granger from United Kingdom, teacher Sadie, teacher Karen, teacher Marta from uh, Unan Leon, and teacher Jairo, a pleasure. Teacher Jose Ovidio, thanks for sharing with us your knowledge about these really important topics for teachers, which is differentiated instructions in the classroom. As well, thanks to all of you who were giving us your questions, your doubts, and also to all the pedagogy.
so who have helped us to carry on with this important event. So we're going to continue with the agenda. A pleasure. Thank you, teacher Hamin. Uh, one language put you in hallway for a lifetime. Two language open every door along the way, Fran Smith. Now it's time for closing remarks. I know we're reading out the information which we're going to take into account in our English classroom. Yes. Bien, en principio, felicitar al equipo, ¿verdad? A nuestro equipo de inglés que han trabajado de manera articulada en toda esta estrategia nacional para venir a fortalecer un idioma extranjero que también viene a fortalecer lo que multilingüismo en nuestra bella Nicaragua. Agradecerle muchísimo a maestro José Ovidio Torres de nuestra hermana República del Salvador. Agradecerle a la señora Ana Greiger de Inglaterra. Agradecerle a la compañera Marta Celia de Unan León. Agradecerle al compañero y a nuestra maestra, Seidy, ¿verdad? Nuestra maestra, Seidy Rosales, ella es maestra de secundaria, maestra de inglés, del departamento de Masaya. Un fuerte saludo y un abrazo solidario a todo el departamento de Masaya que se destaca en todos estos espacios. Y aquí está Seidy representando a su departamento. Felizmente y compartiendo las experiencias que, ha, que hemos tenido en la educación secundaria en este idioma de, del inglés. Bueno, toda esta mañana estuvimos desarrollando temáticas que vienen a fortalecer esa atención diferenciada de, de, para el aprendizaje del idioma inglés, ¿verdad? Y también a ver, a compartir esas estrategias, esas buenas prácticas que contribuyen a ese aprendizaje significativo en nuestros estudiantes desde el ámbito internacional y el ámbito nacional. Es nuestra Nicaragua compartiendo con el mundo a través de este espacio de crecimiento, a través de este espacio de fortalecimiento a las competencias pedagógicas, ¿verdad? didácticas, pero también científicas en lo que es el idioma inglés, y creo que aquí es muy importante destacar lo que nuestros panelistas han compartido en, en el abordaje de esta temática para esta atención diferenciada y, y, y decir por qué esta atención diferenciada precisamente tiene que ver con los niveles de aprendizaje. Nuestros estudiantes y esos queridos maestros, queridos directores que están conectados y están escuchando, que, queridos asesores, es muy importante siempre tenerlo en cuenta dentro del enfoque de nuestro modelo educativo que está centrado en la persona y sabemos que cada persona es un mundo, cada persona tiene conductas diferentes y, y esto te lleva también a tener aprendizajes diferentes. O sea, ni un niño, ni siquiera en primer grado o en séptimo grado, dentro del mismo grado, aprenden por igual. Son aprendizajes diferentes. Entonces, estos espacios que dentro de nuestro modelo educativo y en el marco del trabajo conjunto del CNU, INATEC, Ministerio de Educación, buscamos cómo ir fortaleciendo ese tipo de atención que es muy importante para el éxito de este idioma del aprendizaje del inglés, pero también con esos ejes internacionales que pone a una Nicaragua por encima de muchos países, ¿verdad?, con estas nuevas estrategias y que viene y que lo hace de manera gratuita, o sea que es gratuito. ¿Dónde vas a ir a aprender un inglés con un A2 en primaria, con un B1 en secundaria, de manera gratuita, con personas calificadas, con maestros bien preparados, con compañeros y compañeras internacionales aportando, contribuyendo, que también evidencian que estamos en las buenas rutas, en esas victorias educativas que nos va a llevar 
alcanzar esos aprendizajes en inglés, en A2 para primaria y en B de manera gratuita. Dándole a maestros profesionales especializados, fortaleciendo a nuestros maestros en el territorio, ¿verdad? Con esas especializaciones de manera gratuita. En otros países el maestro tiene que pagar su actualización pedagógica. En Nicaragua, Nicaragua el gobierno le paga a nuestros maestros para que fortalezcan sus competencias, porque Nicaragua cumple un derecho inalienable al pueblo nicaragüense, la educación con calidad, pero también con calidez y de manera gratuita. Entonces, eso es un reconocimiento de nuestro país, de Nicaragua, que a pesar de haber distribuido más de 85 millones de Córdoba en libros de textos para cada estudiante que hoy ha iniciado su año escolar en séptimo grado, ha iniciado una nueva travesía con este idioma inglés en, es, en base a esas normas internacionales, con materiales reconocidos a nivel internacional por empresas prestigiosas que garantizan que nuestros estudiantes sí van a desarrollar esas competencias lingüísticas y comunicativas bajo estas normas internacionales. Y a nadie se le cobró ni un peso. Gratuito. ¿Cuántos maestros? Más de 1.500 maestros en sus manos cuentan con una guía didáctica, metodológica, ¿verdad? De cómo va a desarrollar ese aprendizaje. Nuevo idioma, bajo normas y estándares internacionales. Gratuito se le entregó al maestro en este país. Más de 76 mil estudiantes con un libro de texto en mano, aprendiendo un nuevo idioma que le abre puertas y futuros a estos estudiantes, a estos adolescentes y jóvenes que van a ser nuestro relevo generacional. Y aquí están todo el equipo, todo el equipo nacional y detrás de las pantallas. Allá están aquellos guerreros y guerreras dando la batalla. Queridos asesores y asesoras municipales y departamentales. Y sobre todo, son todas aquellas madres y padres que han confiado en este modelo de gobierno, que han confiado en este modelo educativo, a esos salones de clase, a recibir con amor, con mucho profesionalismo, y de manera ahí pequeño, pero glorioso y patriótico, le entrega a su pueblo. En ese sentido, es muy importante, queridos maestros y maestras, queridos asesores y asesoras, directores y directoras, que asumamos ese compromiso con conciencia revolucionaria, nuestros roles y funciones en cada puesto en la cual se nos ha confiado esta gran misión. Asumámoslo con esa conciencia revolucionaria, con esa conciencia de amor al prójimo, con esa conciencia de amor a Nicaragua. Asumámoslo de nuestros chicos y chicas, nuestros niños, niñas, adolescentes y jóvenes sean realmente ese futuro soñado por Rubén Darío, ese futuro soñado por Sandino cuando liberó a Nicaragua para que hoy Nicaragua sea libre, soberana e independiente. Esa lucha la tenemos que continuar nosotros haciendo nuestro trabajo a través de estos expertos y especialistas que hoy nos han compartido cómo podemos mejorar esa atención diferenciada, cómo podemos implementar estrategias que contribuyan a esa calidad educativa que contribuyen a ese aprendizaje avanzado en el idioma inglés dentro del marco de nuestro sistema de evaluación, es importante que tomemos en cuenta que debemos integrar a todos y a todas nuestros estudiantes de manera conjunta en todo lo que planificamos, en todo lo que programamos. Cuando estamos, pensemos en el que tiene más dificultad de aprendizaje, 
pensemos cómo vamos a nivelar esos aprendizajes diferenciados en ese salón de clase. ¿Qué estrategias me van a permitir lograr esa transición que hoy tienen nuestros chicos y chicas de primaria a secundaria? ¿Cómo voy a nivelar el aprendizaje entre un estudiante y otro? ¿Cómo lo voy a hacer? Solo ustedes tienen la respuesta, queridos maestros y queridos directores. ¿Quién para necesito hacer yo primero? Identificar las fortalezas que tengo yo en la escuela. Por eso hoy hemos estado nosotros, y muy pronto, el 7 de marzo, vamos a, ir, vamos a lanzar una nueva estrategia innovadora desde la educación secundaria, que es la Red Más, que es la Red de Estudiantes Mentores de Aprendizaje Secundario. Y esto va a venir a contribuir como una fortaleza para el maestro de inglés, para el director en ese centro, y decir, ok, Seudi, Seidi, fortaleza en esto, en comunicación, habla muy bien, habla fluido. Seidi va a ser mi mentora en este grado y va a padrinar a, a, a Ana. Y, y de manera conjunta, con el maestro acompañándolo a la paz, vamos a ir trabajando esa red de mentoría en esos aprendizajes que requerimos alcanzar con la misma calidad para todos y todas. También es muy importante hacer uso de proyectos que integren la integración, la inclusión, la equidad. No puede quedar desapercibido la unidad en el aula que contribuyan a la equidad de ese aprendizaje, que contribuyan, ¿verdad?, a fortalecer lo que hoy están aprendiendo. No señalemos los errores en los salones de clase, lo decía uno de los expertos, que esos errores sirvan para los nuevos aprendizajes, pero que lo hagamos de manera muy amigable, que sean áreas de oportunidad y no sean debilidad, no hablemos en nuestro modelo educativo de debilidades hablemos de áreas de oportunidades, oportunidades para crecer, oportunidades para avanzar, oportunidades para ir en victorias educativas y crecimiento de forma positiva, aquí somos una sola familia somos un solo ministerio estamos en un solo barco tenemos una misma misión y es la lucha contra la pobreza a través de una educación con calidad. We really appreciate your powerful words, Mrs. Stesia Torres, because we are sure we're doing great things. God's willing, we're going to implement a lot of activities, okay? And thank you so much, dear English teachers, authorities, and special guests, experts, for giving us these times. May God bless you today, forever, and God bless Nicaragua, because it's in our hearts. Now it's time to listen or anthem of education. Please stand up. <laughs> Avancemos, brigadistas, guerrilleros de la alfabetización. Tu machete es la cartilla. Para mitigar tu campo, la ignorancia del error, avancemos, brigadistas. Muchos siglos de cultura caerán. Levantemos barricadas de cuadernos y pizarras. Sobre su resurrección cultural. 
Puño en alto, libro abierto. Puño en alto, libro abierto. Puño en alto, libro abierto. May God bless you today. Clap your hand for everybody.